Okay, so we are now recording. Well, I am Dame Calandra. I'm from the Kingdom of the Golden Plains, and this is going to be about ankle weaving, uh, which I've been doing for about eight years. An ink, ankle means a small band, and there are many different types of weaving that that can actually technically apply to, but usually when people think of ankle weaving, they think of something that's woven on an ankle loom, such as this. Ankle looms come in many different sizes and shapes. This is a very small one. It is less than a foot long. It's made by Winhaven Fiber Tools and it's their, their original ukulele. They have a new version of it that's a little bit bigger. I have other looms of various sizes. You can get some that, le that weave several yards of trim and they sometimes you can get ones that are floor models that you know, stands up but you're warping this whole thing that's below it. I've seen ones that can weave about 18 yards or so. My biggest one weaves about nine and a half feet, and that's a Becca loom. Sometimes if you're looking at ankle weaving groups, you also see tablet weaving bands, which are technically ankle bands. They're narrow bands. It's just not woven uh, with the same method that we're going to use for these bands. They're used with cards that you turn in different directions that open up the shed, which is what the shuttle passes through. But this one that we're going to do is going to be a little bit simpler on uh, how it's set up. Some basic terms to know with weaving. Um, when we did look at the loom, another is the warp. The warp is the vertical threads on your loom that go around your loom. The weft is what you weave with. And this is on a shuttle. The shuttles come in many different sizes and shapes. And different materials. There's fancy ones, big ones, it just depends on what size loom you're doing. Uh, this is a Sammy shuttle, also some netting shuttles look a little bit like this and it's good for pickup weaving, which is a different way of making some patterns. But we'll go more into that in a little bit here. So you have your variety of shuttles that you can choose from. Now the shed is where your shuttle passes through. In ankle weaving, there are usually two sheds. There are some other techniques where you can create additional ones, but we're gonna start with the basics with showing with the two shed method. We'll go into that here in a moment. Some things of us getting started is what type of thread would you wanna use? Well, you can use just about anything, but you do wanna be cautious about how sticky it is together because you know, if you've ever worked with wool and some other yarns, you know, it likes to stick to itself. So you don't want to use anything that's really hairy, really hairy, like mohair. And also watch it with your wools. There are some that are very, very hairy and fuzzy, and they can really stick together and that can cause some problems. Same with cotton. And so what you can do is periodically you'll have to manually pull apart your threads sometimes. You can use acrylic. Some people say not to. It can be a little bit harder because a, a lot of acrylic yarns have a lot of stretch in them. Same with some wools. And you don't wanna use any yarn that has a lot of stretch. And how you can tell is when you take a piece of yarn and you gently pull it, and it's a little hard to see here. This is the relax, but when I pull it, this one, has a little bit, but not a whole lot versus this is the one time where Red Heart uh, Super Saver is actually a, a really good yarn sometimes, if that's what you have. This is a variegated and the variegators tend to be um, stiffer than some of their others. So when you pull it, there is almost no give on this. There's very little. So if you do want to use acrylic, if that's what you have on hand, then you know give it a try. But if you're using anything that's really soft and has a lot of give to it, it's going to be really hard to maintain your tension. You can do it, but it usually takes a little bit more practice with your tension. For example, this one does have a little bit of stretch to it, but I've been weaving for a long time. And so it's easier for me to maintain my tension at this point. If you're just starting out, I recommend working with cotton, crochet cotton, specifically size number 10 and number five are good choices. Number three is two, but it's harder to find and doesn't come in a whole lot of colors, but you can find some basic colors like black, white, and red. On the handouts, there are some links to some sites with some helpful information. 
as far as resources for getting crochet cotton, pretty much any craft store in Walmart has it. Uses your color selection may vary depending on where you're going. Hobby Lobby has its own brand that it uses and they clearance seasonally. They change the colors. So in the fall, you tend to find some more fall tone, fall and jewel tone colors. In the spring, they'll have some brighter colors. And so the good thing to good time to get it from there is when they're changing their seasonal stuff. And then sometimes you can get balls for like 25 cents or 50 cents. So that's something there. But as I said, any craft store pretty much has that stuff. So we're going to look at the basics of getting started here. So I'm actually going to demonstrate the weaving portion first before showing how to warp a loom. Uh, it's just easier to get a better idea of things when we show how the weaving works first. But before I do that, I'm just going to show some brief pic some pictures of some examples of woven bands. So let me bring that up. And these are woven by me. So we're looking at a style called plain weave. And plain weave just has the two sheds and it's gonna be a basic up and down, back and forth type of weave. And this is an example done with cotton. I, I do like the, I love this cotton yarn from Hobby Lobby. It does stick a little bit, but it does make a nice uh, soft, smooth band. The peaches and whatever, depending on what store you're at is also good. It varies depending on which store you get it from. This is an example woven with size number 10 cotton. You, how wide you weave your bands just depends on what loom you're using. I have a double sided loom that I can weave pretty wide bands with. And then some of my little ones here are very limited. And here's one to show the size difference in looms. The big one is my Becca loom. The little one is the little ukulele loom. And these are showing examples of pickup, which is where you pick up threads from the bottom and certain threads from the top, you may push down on each row to help create a pattern versus just raising and lowering your sheds. That gives a more close up example of a pickup pattern. The ankle pattern, Ankle Weaver's pattern directory, I believe that's how it is. It, uh, it's written on the written on the handout is a good book. It's by Ann M. Dixon. And this is an example of a band that's actually woven with acrylic. This is a variegated yarn, which can add interesting effects in there. and you can get really fancy with your pickup. This is a pattern from, from a book, but this gives you some ideas of things with, of what you can do. So possibilities are really kind of endless on that, of what you can do. All right, so now we're gonna go to the loom. So this one that I'm using here is a Winhaven loom also. It is the Minstrel. It weaves about five and a half feet. Uh, the newest version of it does. There's an older one that weaves a little bit less. The other tiny one I have weaves about two and a half feet, that close to three. Uh, the newer version of it weaves about four feet, I think. It has an extra peg added onto it. So I'm going to talk just, I am going to talk a little bit about warping. We'll show this in a moment. Every loom is going to be different on how you warp it. It's going to have a different path, but most of them will include a picture that shows you how you want to warp it. They're all designed differently. You also see that the tension peg will be in different places. So the tension peg is this one that has a little notch so that it can be loosened so that you can move the warp around the loom. 
and also allows you to adjust your tension. That is very important. When you're looking at a loom, some of the looms will have the tension peg as the very front peg on the loom. I do not recommend those because what happens is as you, as you weave, it's gonna shorten your distance from here to here, which shortens your weaving space. And so you do need to watch out for that. Uh, some people like that, but I don't recommend that. There are some that will have the tension peg in the back. It'll often, it'll, the ones that are in the back will often be a paddle. Um, it's a matter of preference of what you prefer to work with on that. Uh, all of mine have tension pegs pretty much here where it's not the, front, not the first peg, but it's in the front because that's what, what I like to work with. <coughs> So when I was talking about raising and lowering, so back here, let me see if I can get this. Okay. So when I've raised my threads to open a shed, I'm pulling up these threads here. Now, sometimes you may wanna have something like another shuttle or a knitting needle that you can use to separate your threads, but this is my shed to pass my shuttle through. And so when I'm getting started, I am just gonna pull that through. I like to leave a few inches at the front. So I've got a, about two and a half inches or so there. I'm gonna leave a little tail off to the side. Now this I'm not pulling tight because otherwise I would pull everything through. So for the second pass, I'm gonna push down my threads. And I use my shuttle to open everything up. And then I just pull this through. Now what I do is I hold on to this loop. This is a key part in trying to maintain evenness of your threads. We are gonna pull this in a little bit because we don't want the warp thread to be seen because you can see it right now. That's part of what this type of weaving uh, makes this part of weaving is you don't see your warp threads or not your warp, your weft. Sorry, we don't want to see the weft. This is what's called a warp faced weave. What that means is your warp, these threads here are what create your pattern. So I'm pulling that a bit tight here. And this tail from the beginning so my, the last pass I made, I pushed down. I'm going to push down again because I want to take my tail thread and I'm going to pull it back through. So it's the same as my first one. And I'm going to pull this until I don't see my weft and I get it the width that I want it to be. And so I will usually make a couple passes where I pull the tail through. You can knot it and tie it on that is another way and then weave it through in the end. But I like this method. So I'm going to raise my threads again, or raise my shed. And I'm taking my shuttle and I'm beating the threads down. You wanna beat it down tight against the previous row. And then pull and hold on to this loop. When it gets to the edge, I kind of let go of the loop, but I still hold the edge of it and just pinch it. And that helps to maintain the edge and helps to get an even edge. And so since I have raised my thread there, or raised my shed, I'm gonna do that again to pass the table back through the up to the other side. And so that at least helps lock that in. And usually two or three passes with doing that is fine. So now I'm gonna work without doing that, but you can see how my pattern is starting to form. Sorry, the closed captioning was getting that there. And so that's pretty much the basics of the weaving part. So we're going to go into some more details on some other sections of that in a moment. So I want to push this down. Now I had accidentally raised that up. If you pass your shuttle through the same way that it just went, you'll undo your row. So that's how you can undo a mistake. But this is pretty much just a series of up and down. 
your first beginning rose where you have that tail and you're starting, it's going to end up looking a little bit different than how your other rows are. And I actually see that I made a mistake that I am going to go fix. So I'm going to undo here. There we go. My uh, end was sticking up too much and it was making a little loop. We don't want that. So it's just the basic back and forth, up and down. It's one of the reasons why I like the style over tablet weaving for me, because you only have to focus really while you're trying to warp the loom, because that's where your pattern gets formed. And then once you have it warped, it's just set up and down. And you see how that's starting to form there. So some other things are important to know what distinguishes with this. These strings here that are on my threads, these are called heddles. Now you, there's also rigid heddles that you can buy that are made of solid objects that you can use to change your warp. This is one example. So it has slots and it has holes. And so you alternate which one goes through the slot and which one goes through the hole. The same with on here with the string heddles, you're only going over every other warp thread. I'm going to demonstrate how that works here in just a moment. And how to make a heddle. So how you make a heddle is going to vary depending on your loom. Many looms, their manuals or the loom itself will have it marked of which pegs you want to use for making your heddle. But you can also make a jig with two nails at the distance that you like and just use that. But you do want all the heddles that you're using on a project to be the same height. These honestly are just a little bit too high, a little bit higher than I want them to be, but this is a new loom and I haven't had time to make uh, heddles that fit that one exactly. So oftentimes it is gonna be between your heddle peg, the peg that the heddles go on and your top peg, the other limbs can vary. So what I do is I take number 10 cotton, number five tends to loosen itself from the knots, but number 10 is sturdier and will work a little bit better. So I've just taken this and wrapped it around the two pegs. I'm going to cut a little bit off here. I like to use a square knot. If you're not sure how to do that, in the Year of Teaching section, which is available on the event website, there is one of the videos is on knots for crafters. And I go into more detail on various knots that you would use for crafting, including a square knot. So I start with a square knot that I'm tying flush against the peg. And then I actually do two or three of them. My heddles usually last quite a while. Sometimes you'll have one that will start to unknot itself. But I've had some heddles for five, or five years or more. There are some expensive ones of different materials that you can buy. But I've had good luck with these. So I just tied my knots and I'm going to trim my ends a little bit there. And so there's a heddle. It's just a little loop and we'll show how, I'll show how to use that here in just a moment. So we're going to warp the loom. Now how you get this started can vary depending on your loom, especially if you don't have a tension peg in the front. How I like to do it is I start by making a slip knot with my yarn. And I put that around my tension knot on the outside, at least on these two. On my Becca loom, I actually have a spot where I can tie it on a little bit, or there's a little bit of the base that extends outside. And I put my slip knot on that because it doesn't really have a knob. It just has a bolt because I stripped the knob, the second band I wove on it. And then I just replaced it with a nut and that works. 
So when you're weaving, you want to create your patterns with odd number of threads. I prefer to start with a heddled thread. A lot of the patterns you find will start with the thread heddled. Some will tell you it doesn't matter, do unheddled or heddled. But the key thing is with using an odd number is that if you start unheddled, then you're going to end unheddled. If you start heddled, you're going to end up with a heddled on the end so that it matches. The ones that are going to have the heddles attached to them go on top of this peg here that's on the, the first one that you're going over. I so said the path that you take is going to vary depending on your loom. You just want to be consistent on what you follow with that. Okay, so I wrapped around the path that this one wants. So I have this one up here. And I need my heddle. There it is. So I'm going to take the heddle and just Play it in the loop on top of that thread. And then I'm going to pull where I have these two loops together. And I'll grab it. I was being stubborn today. I'm also going to hold on to my thread here at the beginning. This is my heddle peg. This is where all the heddles are going to go. So I'm going to slide that on there. So the next thread is going to be unheddled. So it's going to go under this top peg here. Follow my warping path. I see I'm trying, I'm doing a continuous warp. And so say that I have two of the same color together, I would just continue warping around like that if I'm doing the same color. So now I have a heddle and I have an unheddled thread next to each other. Now this is where I should have another, another heddle. So I'm going to show how to tie on another thread. So let me make a heddle. Generally, you do want to make your heddles before you start your project. But sometimes some things happen and you a heddle breaks or you lose something in the middle and you or realize you don't have enough. Well, if you still have room on your pegs, you can still make another heddle. Also, if you have lots of looms like I do, I do recommend separating your heddles out and labeling which loom they go to. I should do that soon. That would make my life a lot easier because my looms use all different size heddles and I have four looms right now. So I made another heddle. So now we're gonna go over how to add on another thread. There are two ways that you can do it. One is you can tie off each round and tie it to itself. But that way is not as efficient for tension Doing this continuous warp method that I'm showing will actually be better for your tension. For this one, I like to use a double overhand knot and I do two of them in a row. So I have my two ends. Sometimes it's easier to do this one on its side. And don't worry if they're in different places when you tie on your different threads. As long as you leave a couple inches of space when you're starting to weave from your last couple inches from your last knot, you can still make everything work out. So I'm just tying my ends together here. So I like to do the double overhand twice. And so my next thread, next one here is going to be heddle. So that goes over the top of the bar. So you just have to slide things together here. 
So now we're going to put the heddle on again. Okay, so now what do you do when you get to the end of everything? So I'm going to cut this off to leave a little bit that I have to tie with. Now, sometimes I'm able to use the slip knot to get it off of the peg. Sometimes I just have to cut it. That one wanted to come off. Okay. And I can tie off my end there. So I'm going to take I have my first thread and my ending thread. And I'm going to tie them together as close to the first peg as I can get them. So I use a square knot for this one so that I can get it right on top of that. It will create where one thread is going to look a little weird that it crosses over, but that's okay. You can, it'll still work. I usually do a double square knot. But by doing it this way, where it's all tied together as one on the end, it helps distribute the, the tension. Tension is important. If it's too tight, it's going to appear bumpy and, and very rigid. If it's too loose, you're going to see that it's very malleable and the edges aren't going to be very crisp. It takes some time and practice to hit that sweet spot with the tension and knowing what you're looking for. Practice is important on that. And then, so one thing that I didn't do that I should have done is I didn't tighten my tension peg before I started working. That is actually something you wanna do. You want to make sure that you don't put it all the way to the front but you also don't wanna leave it all the way to the back because that shortens the amount of space that you have for weaving and also have the length of your band. I tend to find a spot that's just a little bit in front of the beginning. I have a little bit of space here. This is a really big knob, so there's more space than it looks like. It's probably about half inch but it just depends on your loom and your preferences of how close you want it to be. The closer you do get it to the front, the longer that you're gonna have for your band. But the reason why you don't wanna put it all the way to the front is as you weave, you may need to increase your tension and which means you have to have space to be able to push this peg towards the front of the loom because that will tighten the tension. Now, if we wanted to move the warp around the loom, when you run out of weaving space. That's where you loosen the tension. On some bigger looms, you would flip it on its side. This one, I don't flip on its side because it gets the threads caught in the tension peg and creates a big mess. So on this one, it's a little delicate trying to move it around. So I'm gonna take the, the bottom and I'm just kind of guiding it here. It's starting to move around here. And so my, my heddles have tried to move forward. So I'm gonna push them back up and then slide the tension peg forward again and tighten it. And so you can see these are my starting knots. So you can see how I moved it around a little bit there. And it's hard to see with these colors in my, my lighting at the moment. So that's the basics on getting started with the warping and how the weaving works. Now, you may want to do this and you don't have a loom. There are still some options on that. Where I showed with the rigid heddle, you can buy the heddles you can actually buy. You can get one for 15 bucks or uh, somewhere around there. Uh, sometimes you can find them less. You can get somebody to 3D print one for you. Uh, if you have, or if you have a 3D printer, there are patterns for that. And you can, you can also use a dowel rod with string heddles on it too. That's a method that's used in South American weaving in, in various cultures. And that's something that was actually done in period as well. I recently learned about Irish creos bands, which were belts made out of yarn that were woven that men 
men wore in some places in Ireland, uh, specifically on some islands. I know that's where those were popular. And those were often woven with putting the, something between their feet. It looks like it was probably a, a stick or something. And, and then attach themselves on the other end or open with themselves on the other end to create the tension. But you can use the backstrap method um, or I have this dowel. I could take a belt and attach this to myself and then attach the other end to another fixed object like a doorknob. I've also done between two C clamps, attach one end to one C clamp and the other end to another C clamp. Or even with a dowel, you can have two C clamps on one end to put it through and then uh, attach it on the other end. And then as you weave, you just roll up your weaving. So that's another way you don't have to spend money on looms, which can vary on prices depending on the size of what you're getting. Uh, these ones I did, I believe I do have a link to Winhaven Fiber Tools on one of the handouts. They are very hard to get. They are handmade and sometimes, well, it may say it's gonna come in a week. It may take five or six months for you to get your loom, but they are well worth it. I have a Becca, which is good. Shocked and Ashford are other good brands for ankle looms. There are a lot of other makers out there on Etsy that you can look at. So you have a lot of different options on what you can do. So we have some more time here. And I wanna to touch on one of the handouts that talks about how to make your patterns and some basic weaving theory with that. On that handout, there are links to a couple pattern generators that websites you can use to make your patterns. There's also uh, links to paper, that graph paper that you can use for laying out your patterns. You don't wanna use regular straight graph paper. There's some different types of beading graph paper that makes things offset that is more like what the pattern that you, or the more creates the effect that you need for this type of weaving because it's not gonna be a straight up and down when you're looking at how your, how your threads go together. So basic theory with weaving is that two colors together make a solid, will make a solid line. Sorry, I'm having an issue with there a moment. Let me actually, bring that document up just a moment. Actually, I'm sorry, I shared the wrong one. Let's bring up the right one. But that one does have links to the pattern generators too. There we go. Okay, so when you're graphing out your patterns, there's another way to do is you can just make a two line graph and this upper one is for my heddle threads. And so then I go down to the next one and that is on the bottom here and that is my unheddled thread and I go up to the top and I have a heddled. Um, so you're skipping a space, the white spaces are, are, are nothing on there. And so, in this pattern, I have one of color A, it's heddled, and then color A that's unheddled, and then B it's heddled, A is unheddled, and then A that's heddled. So that line of B in the middle is gonna appear as a dashed line in my pattern. But the two, the two A's that are next to each other are gonna make a solid line, and these two A's are gonna make a solid line on the other side of it. If you alternated A and B for each one, you're going to get alternating horizontal bars of color. And if you did two A's next to each other and two B's next to each other and two A's, then you're gonna get solid, line, solid vertical lines of A, B, A, B, if you follow that. Now they're not gonna appear perfectly straight because of the nature of how this weave is set up, it's just gonna, it's gonna look slightly wavy. It's just gonna be a little bit offset from each other, but that's how you get the vertical lines. 
And so you can play around with different pat different ways of doing things of and see what kind of patterns you can create. Crenellation, checkerboards, offset checkers, those are things that you can easily do. You can make things that kind of look like crosses or little flowers. Uh, I like the Car Carolingian realm one that's linked. That one is a very easy one to use. The other pattern thread or pattern generator is a little more difficult, but you can create more complex and pick up weaves with it. But I find the, the Carolingian realm one is uh, very straightforward. You select the number of uh, the number of threads that you want, the total number. And then there's a little graph thing and there's a color chart. You just pick the color that you want and then you click where you want on the graph for it to go. And it will highlight that, make that whole row that color for you. And so you can play around with that. And you can uh, save your designs. I've had trouble with my devices on that, but you can also screenshot them. I also will tend to just take a piece of paper and write out my pattern of how I want it, but I can see that in my head. Some people have trouble, you need the actual colors. So that's where also using the, the, the brick stitch paper for bead weaving or bead work, I should say on that because not really weaving, but the brick stitch pattern uh, paper will be offset that will help you with trying to color in your own patterns if you want to do it that way. So you have a lot of different choices. Now I'm going to go back to the weaving and show some common mistakes when you're starting out and how to go about trying to fix that and watch out for it. The biggest problem that people tend to have when they're starting is getting your edges to be even. And actually, just a moment, I'm gonna go turn off my light because I have too much sunlight in here now and that should make it easier for you to see. Just a moment. Okay, that should make things a little bit easier on here. So you don't have as much light now. Okay, so I'm raising my shed, I'm beating things down. And I'm not gonna bother holding on to things, I'm just letting that go. So then, yeah, I'm just gonna let that lay on the side there. This is what not to do. I'll do a close up in a moment to show what it looks like when I'm not holding on to things and just letting it go. Okay. So these are the ones down here where I held onto my edge and it's nice and neat on the top. These here where things are starting to get a little wonky is where I wasn't holding onto the edge. And you can see that it's a little loose here and this one's going out, bulging out a bit. And then over here, you can see where my weft thread is peaking up between these last two. Almost everybody, when you're starting out, you will have rows that will start looking like this. So when you see that, you can undo it. So to undo my row, I'm going to, actually, I'm gonna go down. This one would normally be where I go up. So I'm gonna go down to take that out. I'm going to unweave these rows here. It's another difference from tablet weaving because tablet weaving can be a lot harder to remove your mistakes. <laughs> but it's still a fun weaving, to, fun weave to do. Okay, so now I've un I undid my mistakes there. So I'm gonna demonstrate again how to get it to not be wonky on the edges. This is something, there are different methods of doing it, but this is just the one that I find that works well for me is once again, I'm holding on to that loop. 
until I get right to the edge. So I'm gonna add a little loop right here at the edge. So I'm going to pinch down on that loop. And I'm not pinching very hard because I actually have trouble with doing that. Uh, I have tendonitis issues, so that can actually be a problem. So it's not really that, even that hard. It's just gently, just enough little pressure to hold onto it and you, you'll feel it. Now you don't wanna pull it too tight because you can pull it so tight that it starts to pull in. You can see how I'm starting to pull that in. If you do that, you can just gently tug at the edges, both sides together. And so I've pulled it back out again. But just holding on to the edge will help maintain a fairly even edge. Now, another problem that tends to come up is after you've advanced the loom a little bit and trying to maintain your evenness and edges. One, you may have to play with the tension a little bit. You may have to undo a couple rows after you advance the, advance the warp, which advancing the warp is moving the band around the loom. Another thing that helps with trying to maintain the even size is you can kind of see how it's narrower here than it is up here. It starts to get really wide. I tend to watch it when I start to get to a point where I'm hitting that wideness, I will stop and that's when I'll advance the loom. So I won't go all the way up to the last place I can put my shuttle through. Usually I would stop about here and that's where I would advance the loom because that will help maintain the evenness on your band. Because some of them are a little bit harder than others. This one can't, because it has such a high foot right here, it's really hard sometimes at the start because my shuttle of I don't have enough room to pass my shuttle through evenly. The redesigned one here has a lower footprint, so it's easier. And so that's another thing is when you're advancing the loom is that you don't always want to move the band all the way to the beginning. Sometimes you want to leave it like on this one. I advance it to where it stops here so that it's easier to pass my shuttle through and I don't end up with odd things and causes tension issues if I try to put it too close here. So that's something that's gonna vary on the looms that you use on how that works. Some of them also are gonna have really tiny places for putting your hand to, to raise and lower your threads. And so look at that when you're considering a loom and how big your hands are. I have small hands, so it's not usually an issue for me. But I know other people that that can be a problem. With my husband, when he was trying to do ankle weaving, he needed one that had a lot of space to be able to, to maneuver that. Okay, so that's the basics. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. And we have a couple minutes for questions here. Justin, let me get this stop.